serve site manager. So the serve site manager is another big step above the food handler level. So the reason for that, and actually one big reason why serve site manager is a very difficult exam to be passed by high schoolers, is because most of the time you're not expected to be the backstop. You're not expected to be the manager, the leader, the one where the buck stops with you. Right? Ordinarily, if any of you guys have a job out of the big wide world at the moment, then you probably have a supervisor, a manager, a general manager, all sorts of people above you. But when you, uh, when you have to make a decision, you quite often have to check out with them and make sure that they're okay with that decision. Right? And so you're not the one who someone comes to you and says, is this okay for me to do this? And you have to be the one person who says yes or no. Right? So that's one of the biggest reasons why this exam is so difficult for you guys to be able to do, because you can't empathize necessarily with what's expected in the questions that are going to be asked. So that's where I'm going to have to make you, have to help you to understand and empathize and think in that kind of way, okay? Because you have to believe that you are capable of this, which you are, because we've been studying a lot of this stuff for quite a while now. But it's important that you put yourself in that frame of mind that um, an employee comes to you, you have to make a decision on the knowledge and understanding of the law that we have so that you can say, yes, that's safe, no, that's not safe, okay? So we'll work our way through. We're going to be uh, looking at some good examples. We're going to have lots of questions in there and there are typical kinds of questions that are asked so you can kind of understand where they're coming from when they start asking these questions. We're also going to listen to some of our Dirty Restaurant episodes so that you can hear directly about some of the issues that come up in, uh, in food service at the moment that, uh, that those managers are expected to have to deal with so that, that way you can hopefully avoid some of those pitfalls but you can understand how they happen and what, what should be done to avoid them, okay? So with that being said, I'm going to start off today playing one of those. Well, we have a couple of restaurants here that did not do well when the health inspector showed up. One is uh, Akahana Asian Bistro, okay, on the plaza, 87.5. Ouch. Whoa. I don't know if Akahana means nasty, but uh, yeah, that's, the person in charge was not on duty at first when the inspector showed up, and when he did, the inspector learned the person in charge knows nothing about proper storage, cold holding, cooling time and temperatures, date marking, or cooking temperatures. What does he know? He knows how to unlock the front door. Baseball cards from the 1980s? <laughs> Talk about clueless management. Well, yeah, I've known clueless managers before. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, let's see, observe kegs and a rice cooker blocking the hand sink. Uh, oh, no problem. I guess the clueless manager thought that was fine. Observe raw meat uh, stored above produce. That's a repeat violation. Wow. And then some chicken wings that were in the fryer were being pulled out before they were done. They were going to finish them later. The health inspector going, no, no, you don't do that. Do it all at once. Yeah, there you go. Uh, fried soft shell crab and shrimp were at the wrong temperature cooling. And uh, so they had to be thrown away. Apparently, they had been cooling from the night before. Wow. Woo. And uh, the brisket, the chicken, and the rice noodles had no data. Oh, come on. <laughs> Again, some more mystery being answered. From a clueless manager at Akahana Asian Bistro on the Plaza 87.5. I just love how they listed all the things he does nothing about. That's right. it's just, he doesn't know this. He doesn't know that. He can't remember his wife's name or her name. <laughs> And then we have the Mandarin restaurant on uh, Mount Holly Huntersville Road 89. Oh, come on. Observed a large container of chicken that uh, was in the process of being brined. But uh, the inspector said, you need to break this down into smaller containers. Well, a food employee picked it up and splashed chicken juice all over ready to eat cat. Oh, <laughs> sounds like a three stooge. Yeah, not this seasoning. I'm like, then they had to voluntarily throw out some egg rolls that uh, were just sitting on a shelf. Oh, oh. Yeah, so we're storing them in proper food containers, and that was a repeat violation. <laughs> Observe the food employee washing dishes twice and never use sanitizer. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which might also explain why a stack of uh, containers that were supposed to be clean were not. And that was a repeat violation. In fact, the inspector says, I'll be back to make sure you guys get this 
uh, washing things in a pan. Yeah. Then uh, they had cabbage, egg noodles, general so's chicken and egg rolls. Uh, they're supposed to be sold or thrown away in a four-hour time period. Well, they weren't. They didn't have a time. <laughs> the inspector said, wash your fruits and vegetables, please. They were using unwashed mushrooms. Ew. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why that sounds so much grosser than a lot of my unwashed mushrooms. <laughs> oh. So that's the Mandarin restaurant on the Mount Holly Huntersville Road at 89. Oh, man. You gotta get in at least into the 90s. Yeah. Come on. You can hear. You got some problems going on there. So we had that first restaurant, there's no manager who had the surf safe certification who was, who was on duty. Well, I can tell you one big reason why you guys really push, which really should push hard for this surf safe certification, is because nationwide there is perpetually a shortage of people with this certification to take these jobs. So it's a big deal. It's a huge deal for you to be able to be assured of getting a job and keeping a job. This certification is a huge thing for you because all these restaurants, not just in the, in this area, but all over the country, need these people. Okay. Um, but yeah, so they had blocked hand sinks. I can tell you, when a health inspector walks in, is the first thing that he or she sees is a blocked hand sink because there's dishes in there, because there's boxes in the way, because there's fish defrosting in there, whatever it might be. Straight away, you're setting them off because they're looking for patterns in behavior. If they see that, that means no one's washing their hands. And then on top of that, they probably have bad habits all over the place, which that's the case, right? That's what we saw with that inspection. Um, refrigerators, incorrectly storing food, putting uh, ready-to-eat foods underneath other foods which are raw, which could contaminate, which can cause cross-contamination. We're going to go over again, like you did in the surf safe food handle level, we're going to go over that stacking system just so that you remember it, but it's vital to keep your food safe. Um, when you look at the time and temperature, temperature abuse for chicken, crab, shrimp, very, very high-risk foods, right? These foods, we have to make sure that we keep them safe. They were abusing time and temperature with them being out of refrigeration, not properly heated, not properly chilled, all over the place. It can make people significantly, uh, you know, can, can, can give some significant numbers of sickness uh, with, these, with this kind of behavior. Cross-contamination was a massive problem that they had. Um, you know, we understand just from what we do in here on a daily basis, washing, rinsing, sanitizing, making sure that our dishes and pots and pans are properly clean because if you're not going to properly clean them you might as well not clean them at all right so it's vital that we do that but this is the hard part when it comes to you being in the position to understand this and to be able to answer these correctly if it's you that's responsible for this then you have to be that person who's the mean guy right who's the one who comes in and says no you're not properly doing this we need to change the way that you're doing this okay you need to be in that frame of mind so be thinking about these real life problems. Imagine if you were one of these managers who now has the embarrassment of having that low score up on their front door and they want to do something to change that. You can be the change, okay? So today we're gonna to start off, we're gonna be looking at providing safe food and we're also gonna be looking at for, uh, forms of contamination that we have to deal with as well, okay? So just to get ourselves started, when is a foodborne illness considered an outbreak? So I've got three options for you. Is it two or more people have the same symptoms after eating the same food? Is it that the regulatory authorities have investigated? Or is it that the outbreak is confirmed by laboratory analysis? You're saying A? Anyone disagree? Anyone want to go with anything else? So, it's actually all three of the, okay? It's all the above. So when a foodborne illness um, is considered an outbreak, then it has to be these three things simultaneously happening. Two or more people ate the same food and got sick. The regulatory authorities, which we're going to talk more about that, because the regulatory authorities are local authorities. The ones who create and uphold the regulations is not done on a federal basis. Federal basis comes from the uh, comes from recommendations. 
the local level, that's where we have our Department of Health. They're the ones who actually set the regulations specific to our area, and they're the ones who will then come in and do an investigation. The outbreak is then confirmed by laboratory analysis. We don't just have it where we go on hearsay. Oh, you say that you got sick? You say that you got sick after eating in that restaurant? They're going to do some analysis. They're going to start pulling foods from that restaurant. They're going to be interviewing people. They're going to be doing a whole analysis on the whole situation. Because what is, you own a restaurant, you've done nothing wrong, but you've got a few people in the uh, out in the world who have something against you, and they try and uh, they try and say that you're making people sick. They're going to make sure that there's some lab analysis to prove exactly where it came from. It could even be that it came from one of the supply chain uh, that supplied that restaurant. It may it may not have been any fault of that restaurant itself. But that's also why it's important when you are a manager in one of these establishments. And the health department knocks on your door and says, hey, we have a possible outbreak that's happening. We suspect it could be emanating from your establishment. You must cooperate with them because they're not against you. They are working with you to help find out what's going on. It may be nothing to do with your practices or any of your protocols. It may be to do farther back in the supply chain. Okay? So never try and make things up. Never lie. Never try and work against them. Always work with them. Chances are, if you're doing all the right things, they will prove your innocence in the whole situation and they will actually find out exactly where it came from. But if you try and do something against that process, it could end up just delaying it and damaging your business even more unnecessarily. All right. But about 48 million people um, have uh, food poisoning in the United States every year. It's a lot of people. And those are the ones which are investigated. I would say that chances are, there's plenty more that happen, and you know, no one investigates. If you get sick after grilling out in your own backyard, do you call up the uh, health department? Probably not. right? So there's probably a whole lot more than that um, around there as well. So what challenges do we have, especially as food service managers, do we have in the industry? Time. We're always busy. right? And as a manager in a food service organization, I can tell you, you are never slow. You are always busy. And so language and culture, that can be a tricky thing as well. You may be working with individuals who don't speak the same language as you as their first language. Cultures. So I can tell you from experience, coming from Europe, about 20 years ago, no, 25 years ago, we had, uh, we had a case where all together, all the countries in the European Union decided that they were going to follow the same rules, the same laws as each other. This was a massive culture shock for some countries who believed that refrigeration was something that was slightly cooler than a warm summer day, and other countries who had a similar type of setting as the United States. But we all had to come together and figure out what was, uh, on in terms of bacteriological um, uh, issues, what was acceptable and what was not. And so um, cultural issues can cause difficulties. Just always bear that in mind, be empathetic, but be firm to the law. Um, literacy and education can be a challenge as well. You may have to be teaching people, but you may have to show them more than you ask them to read. If you just supply some employees with a book to read about health, safe, health and safety, they may not be able to read it. You may have to overcome those issues. Um, pathogens. What's a pathogen? A pathogen is a germ, a bacteria, mold, virus that makes us sick. They're always a challenge. That's what we're up against. Um, unapproved suppliers. We're going to talk about only ever using approved suppliers, but it's a huge problem in our industry in general because the temptation is there to purchase things that may be cheaper or to go to maybe a farmer's market that we don't know the safety of that farmer's market um, or to go you know, to different places where we might like to get foods, but really they may, may not be entirely safe. Right? So we have to make sure, we have a responsibility to make sure we only purchase from approved suppliers. Um, high risk customers, if, you're, if you work in a, in a retirement home or if you work in any restaurant that regularly gets um, older people or younger people or, um, or others who have immune uh, deficiencies, 
we have to make sure that we are we are aware of that and that we work to keep them as safe as possible as well. Also, staff turnover. Why is staff turnover an issue? Well, if you have um, if you have employees who come in, you train them on all the food service safety, and then they leave, then the next batch that come in won't necessarily have that same training. You may have to do it all over again, and that's when it circles all the way back up to the top again. Time. We never have enough time. Right? These are all of our challenges. So what's the uh, human cost of foodborne illness? So lost work for those individuals who get sick. Medical costs, which can be very significant. Um, Long-term disability, because some of these illnesses can be life-changing. And then the worst of all, death. So we have about 3,000 people every year who die from foodborne illnesses in the United States. It would be great to get rid of every one of those. Right. So unsafe food is usually, not always, but usually the result of contamination of some sort. It's the presence of a harmful substance in our food. So we've got three different ways that this generally happens. We have biological. So that's when we've got molds, virus, and, and uh, uh, bacteria that are growing in our food. We're going to talk about how we slow them down, stop them in their tracks, um, or eliminate as much as possible to keep our food safe for a little while. Chemical. So it can be something as simple as our cleaning chemicals that we're spraying around thinking we're doing a good thing, but really we're contaminating our food. Those cleaning chemicals are still chemicals. If we make them too strong in our solutions that we use, if we accidentally spill or drip those on by storing them incorrectly, all of these different things can cause cross-contamination, and chemical cross-contamination can be lethal. Uh, then we also have physical hazards. I have a lovely picture right here of a hamburger with one of those delicious band-aids. Not my choice, right? That's one, one of the worst things you could possibly ever find. But it might not be something as obvious as that. It could be a hair. It could be a fish bone. It could be all sorts of different things. It could, it could even be a piece of metal. So if you think about companies like Tyson, huge, great big uh, chicken production companies, they will have things like uh, uh, metal, uh, metal detectors on their conveyors, just to make sure that if anything falls off of their, uh, their mechanical systems as they're working, that they detect it and it's eliminated from their, uh, from their process before it ever reaches the customers. But it's important for, from our standpoint in the kitchen that we do everything we can in our power to make sure that we safeguard against any of these types of things as well. Most of the time, these types of mistakes are made through unsafe practices. It's as simple as that. If we have, uh, if we have things set in place, but we always work towards safety first, then we can eliminate most of these issues. So how does food become unsafe? So we purchase from unapproved suppliers, like I've already mentioned, and I'm gonna talk about it several more times uh, throughout this course. It's really important that we go to approved suppliers. Who are they? It could be as simple as Walmart, Sam's Club, um, yeah, any of the grocery stores around. They're all approved because they track all of their supply lines, all their supply chains, all the way back to the farm where it's grown in. Because they, when they stick their name on any products, they guarantee that food will be safe. In order to be able to do that, you have to know where it's coming from. As a chef, we don't have time to go over and check on the farmer each day and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. We're, we're, busy, we're busy taking care of making sure that all of our food is prepared uh, to serve. But by using approved suppliers, and so that might be companies like US Foods, Riches, who deliver to us, they're all approved as well because they keep a very close check on all of their supply chain. Time and temperature abuse. So this, this is something we've talked about a lot. This is where things are not kept either cold, 41 or below, outside of the temperature danger zone, or hot, 135 and above. Right? We always keep foods as much as possible outside of that temperature danger zone. Unless if you are cooking it or chilling it rapidly, then we always keep our food outside of that zone to make sure our food stays safe, but also to preserve the quality of our food as well. 
cross contamination, as you can see that delightful picture there, and raw chicken and uh, and lettuce. Hopefully, you would never do something as obvious as that. However, just looking at that photograph, you know that it's probably happened at some stage. But it might be that you went, you you, know, you chopped up a piece of that chicken on that board, and then you went off and did something else, and then you came back, forgot that you had just uh, done something raw on that board. And then after that, you carried on doing something that was ready to eat, right? The foods that will not be heat treated again. Poor personal hygiene. Um, so everyone probably has a bad habit here or there. Or it might just be that you have an itch on your head or your ears. You know, your ears itchy or your, you know, your eye you know, feels like you got an eyelash in it. You start touching on your skin and then you go right back to work. Cross-contamination issues are happening, okay? So be very careful, do your very best to have the best hygiene practices uh, for your personal hygiene. Just as a personal thing, it's better to have as well. And then poor cleaning and sanitizing. You see this guy has the rag in his pocket there. Well, we never do that type of thing, right? We have our sanny buckets with our, uh, with our detergent, our rinse, and our sanitizing buckets so that we always keep all of those things separate. But it's important that, uh, that we make sure that we always do all of those processes. If you always do all those processes, you have a safe environment to work in. It's when you bend the rules. But you as managers need to be on the lookout for other employees who may be looking to try and bend the rules. They may even justify it by saying, hey, I'm just trying to be efficient. I'm just trying to do a better job for you. But it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, if they're doing things like that, they're not doing a better job for you. Right? They're, they're doing something that's maybe, maybe making themselves quicker at their job, but they're doing a worse job for you because the fact is they're possibly creating cross-contamination issues. All right, is it okay for a food service operation to use food prepared in a private home? Why not? Exactly, exactly. So it is not an approved supplier, right? Okay, so let's look at hand washing. You are responsible for the safety of the food you handle. If you're not careful, you can transfer pathogens such as bacteria and viruses from your body to food. The good news is that there are some simple things you can do to prevent this. One of the most important is correct hand washing. Sadly, most people don't wash their hands correctly or as often as they should. Here's the correct way to wash your hands. First, wet your hands and arms with running water as hot as you can comfortably stand. Next, apply enough soap to build up a good lather. Then, scrub your hands and arms vigorously for 10 to 15 seconds. Clean under your fingernails and between your fingers. When finished, rinse your hands and arms thoroughly under warm running water. Finally, dry them using a single-use paper towel or hand dryer. element in them as well um, so there is there's no more bacteria that you get from one of those hand dryers than you would if you were to use paper towels I know it would seem like it's like wouldn't that be like a place that would harbor them but the fact is that that actual dryer itself is very very dry inside because it's perpetually heating up and blowing hot air onto your hand and so the actual environment itself is not conducive to bacterial growth something that's really important that we saw on that video that I need you to remember that. So when it comes to taking the surf safe manager exam, they may ask you, how many seconds do you have to wash and lather your hands? So as you saw on that video, it said 10 to 15 seconds. That was the standard, and that currently still is technically the standard. Now during COVID times, we have now moved on from that, and we are now saying 20 seconds is what should be the norm. It wouldn't surprise me if, if uh, in, in, in the not-too-distant future, 
if we update that to say 20 seconds, it should be the norm. But, but in terms of the exam itself, 10 to 15 seconds is still the recommendation that's written on there. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Okay. Is it okay for a food service operation to use food? Did I already have that one? Yeah, I already had that one. Okay. So, how food becomes unsafe? So, we can have poor cleaning and sanitizing. Something that we do a good job of in here every day, but it's really easy if you have an employee who's paid minimum wage, who doesn't care about their job, who doesn't care about the ramifications, because they're not the manager who can have to talk to the Department of Health, and they may not be doing as good a job as you would hope. That's why as a manager, you have to be the backstop. You have to be the one who, uh, who makes sure and inspects this stuff yourself. So equipment and clean uh, and utensils are not washed, rinsed, and sanitized between uses. Food contact surfaces are wiped clean instead of being washed, rinsed, sanitized, right? Always that process. Wiping cloths are not stored in a sanitizer solution between uses. So that's why we generally will use paper towel, so that way I know that a student is just throwing it in the trash afterwards. But if you use uh, cloths to do that, uh, to do all of that cleaning, then you would keep those cloths in between, say if you had a restaurant table um, that you were washing, you would keep that cloth in between washes in the sanitizing solution to kill off the bacteria, okay? And then uh, sanitizing solutions are not at the required level. Too low, they're not sanitizing, they're not killing the bacteria. Too high, you could be creating a chemical food poisoning issue. All right, so what's the problem here? Time and temperature abuse, cross-contamination, poor personal hygiene, or poor cleaning and sanitizing? Poor personal hygiene, who, anyone else agree? Yeah, that's, a, that's our problem right there. Poor personal hygiene, they're sneezing right into their hand, right over the food they're about to deliver. Who wants that salad? All right, what's the problem? Time and temperature abuse, cross-contamination, poor personal hygiene, or poor cleaning and sanitizing? Absolutely, yeah, there's some blood that's dripped down from the meat that's sitting right above it. This is a definite, huge problem. because So these lettuce are ready to eat. Where should they go? Right, the very top of our refrigerator, so they cannot be dripped on. Okay, what's the problem? So these are chicken breasts. The temperature reading on that thermometer is 115 degrees. Is it time and temperature abuse, cross-contamination, poor personal hygiene, or poor cleaning and sanitizing? Saying A? Yeah. Yeah. Time and temperature abuse. What temperature do we have to take our chicken up to? You guys remember? 165. So 115, we've got bad bacteria problems coming our way. Right, exactly. Always measure from, from that largest part and portion of the meat to make sure that the core internal temperature is 165. Very good. Okay, what's the problem? So we're wiping the table here um, between uses just with a single use towel. Is it time and temperature abuse, cross contamination, poor personal hygiene, or poor cleaning and sanitizing? Poor, uh, poor cleaning and sanitizing? You guys agree? Absolutely, because when we're cleaning, uh, when we're cleaning uh, tables like this, we should be washing, rinsing, sanitizing every time, no matter what. Okay, so let's look at our high-risk populations. So we have the elderly, we have preschool-age children, and we have people who have a compromised immune system. So we have to make sure we safeguard these individuals. Um, uh, pregnant women are no longer classified by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, as a high-risk population. There are some foods that they are recommended to avoid or to be very careful of. Certainly things like undercooked meats, undercooked eggs, um, some soft cheeses, um, and different things like that. But they are not considered, in general, to be a high-risk population. Okay, So remember those three, the uh, very old, very young, or people with a, an uh, immune system that's compromised in some sort of way. So how do we keep our food safe? Focusing on these measures. So we have 
Posting from approved reputable suppliers. Controlling time and temperature of food coming out from the refrigerator or freezer, being cooked and maintained either hot or cold. We don't maintain food warm. Um, preventing cross-contamination. Practicing good personal hygiene, cleaning and sanitizing. So we need to be able to train our employees, and that's where you guys will be uh, will be ready to do this type of thing by having the knowledge that you'll have. So a surf safe manager has responsibilities to train staff to follow the food safety procedures that your establishment has. They provide the initial and ongoing training. I always recommend, and in jobs I've had, we would have these little meetings where we talk about just little snippets. But it's important that, the, that food safety is always at the forefront of people's minds. Whether you're working in the restaurant side or the kitchen, the front or back of the house, it doesn't matter. Everyone's going to have a role in making sure that that food is safe every step of the way. But so it's important that by keeping it in the forefront of people's minds, then they will recognize and remember how important these things are. So provide all staff with a general food safety knowledge when they're first employed in the, in the organization. Provide job-specific food safety training as well, because there may be some very specific things that, uh, that a task might be done by a specific employee. Then you have to make sure that they understand exactly how to do that. Some processes may be more tricky than others to, uh, to, uh, you know, to make sure that you have a safe environment. You have to make sure you identify all of those, all of, all of those tasks to keep them safe. And we'll talk later on about those kinds of safety protocols and how we analyze those as well. And then always retraining staff regularly. Have those little quick five minute meetings just to talk about one thing at a time, but do them regularly so it's always at the forefront. Make sure you document training. When a health inspector comes in, they're gonna ask you. They're gonna say, so when, when do you do training? So it's a good thing to keep a log of the employees who were trained and how often they're trained and what they're trained in so that they can see if things are being done correctly. Monitor staff to make sure that they're following the procedures because you can train them to, hey, make sure that you don't use that same chopping board for doing the chicken as well as the lettuce every single day. But if you then just walk away and just leave them to it and they don't pay any attention to you because they don't believe what you're saying is really real, then the fact is they can make people sick. You still ultimately, as the manager, have that responsibility to make sure that they're kept safe. And then any uh, incorrect behavior, retraining is necessary. So the person in charge must be a certified food protection manager. They have to be on site during any operating hours. So notice I didn't say during open hours, I said during operating hours. Because that business, you may have employees coming in a couple of hours before you open to start baking the bread or to start prepping up the food and things like that. You have to make sure from the minute that you are operational, there's at least one surf safe uh, protect, food protection manager on duty, always. Um, and make sure that they show that they have the required knowledge with certification, right? That's why we have these certifications. To become a, a certified food protection manager, you have to pass an exam from the accredited program. The program must be accredited by, the, by an agency approved by a conference for food protection. Completing this course, and passing the surf safe exam meets that requirement. What is it? Well, why is it important to be a certified food protection manager? So the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, suggests that it reduces the risk of foodborne illness, and it was uh, it was a distinguishing factor between restaurants that experienced an outbreak and those that did not. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, study suggests. More effective controls of risk, uh, risk factors for foodborne illnesses occur as well. So basically what this comes down to is in the restaurant or the hotel or the private club or anywhere else that you work, when they see, uh, when they have a food protection manager on site, it's almost like having an extension of the health inspector being in there every single day. That's what they're relying on you to do is to be the health inspector every single day, okay? 
So there's no gray areas. You're either doing it the safe way or you're not doing it the safe way. Okay? That's why they rely on you. That's why when they walk in the door, they're going to be looking for you. And that's why you have to make sure that every single day, you don't just about get through that day. You get through that day knowing that if that health inspector walked through that door, that you'd be happy to see them. So the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, inspects all, uh, all foods except meat, poultry, and eggs. They regulate the transport across state lines. They provide technical support and training. They issue the food code. We're going to talk more about the food code in a little while. The FDA food code provides recommendations for food safety regulations. Notice what it says there. It provides recommendations. It's not the law. Okay? So the, on a federal level, we do not get any of our food safety laws at all. On a federal level, it's recommendations handed down to the state. After, they, after that, our laws are actually created by uh, cities, counties, and states, and tribal agencies. That they create the law to actually decide exactly how we have to do this. The fact is, though, on a federal level, they have the resources to be able to do all the scientific data and um, recording to be able to put all these things together to know what's the safest method for all of these things. That's why on a federal level, they create the food code. They give out that the food code book to everyone, and you can look it up online. Um, you can get it any day you want. It's jargon-filled. It's tough. It's written by scientists and lawyers. It's not pleasant to read as a uh, bedtime story, but it has everything that you need to know. So you can always look it up. If there's something you're not sure about to double check on, you can always look it up in there. But that is recommendations from the federal government to the local state authorities. They are then the ones who will actually put it into law and we have to go by it. The health inspectors that come in, come in from your local authority. They do not come in from the federal government. Okay, very important to remember, we get our laws from our local government. So the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, are the ones that regulate meat, poultry, and eggs. Okay, they're the ones that take care of those three. They also regulate the transport across state lines and um, uh, any food that's involving more than one state. So this, the CDC... Uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the Public Health Services, as they assist the FDA and USDA and state and local health departments. They conduct research into causes of foodborne illness outbreaks, and they, insist with, uh, they assist with those outbreaks to try and figure out what's going on, especially when it's a very wide, uh, widespread type of outbreak that could happen. So, as I mentioned, so the state and local regulatory authorities write or adopt the codes uh, regulating the food, uh, regulating the retail and food service operations. The code may differ from the uh, uh, from the FDA food code as well. So, food safety uh, responsibilities include inspecting operations. So, this is what our local authorities will do. They inspect our operations. They enforce the regulations. They investigate complaints and illnesses. And they issue licenses and permits for you to be able to open in the first place. Okay, let's take a look now at different forms of contamination that we have to tackle. So contaminants can come from a variety of different places. Animals used for foods, the air, contaminated water and dirt in general, chemicals used uh, in the operation. And then natural contaminants, things like bones and fish, from people, and this can be by accident or deliberately. Uh, so if you have, that's a great question. So if you have a thriving business, I've got Bob's Burgers over here, I have a thousand people coming in my door every single day, and right opposite, I've got a restaurant that's failing and that's jealous, and they wish that they could be as successful as we could be. They may look at us with jealousy and think, well, maybe if I took their business out, then I'd get all of their customers. 
so maybe they try and maybe break in to your operation, or maybe they uh, maybe they get try and get someone to be hired over in my operation to purposely taint the food and contaminate the food. It might be that you have an employee who's disgruntled. Yeah, they're late every single day, so you wrote them up. They might get fired next week if they keep on walking in late. Well, in their opinion, they're justified in walking in late because they just don't like getting out of bed in the morning. Well, so they, they can turn around and say, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do I'm gonna spill some of that sanitizer all over the lettuce. That'll that'll get them back for telling me off coming in late again. Right? So there are times when we have to safeguard against these things. And you as the food protection manager have to be the backstop. You have to be the one that's watching that kind of thing. If you're working in a large hotel, say, you may have someone who came into your kitchen who looks like they're an electrician or a plumber or something like that. They you know, they walk in there and they're working on stuff. Do you know that they're supposed to be in here? You'd hope that you wouldn't have anyone who would be you know, as uh, daring as that just to walk in and do as they please. But it can happen. And so if you have someone who walks in who you don't know who they are in your kitchen, you ask them, good afternoon, good morning, how are you? Can I help you? Because it could be that they're there to do something that's bad. Okay, so you have to be security as well. Contaminants can come from a variety of different places. The fecal oral route of contamination is a significant one that we see there. Failure to wash your hands after using the restroom, feces on your fingers gets into food, and then the food is then eaten. This is one of our biggest problems that we have. This is why our hands are incredibly creative things and we can do amazing things with it, but our hands can also be one of the most lethal things in the kitchen. Contaminants can come from um, things like contact with people who are sick, from one person to another, sneezing or vomiting into food or onto food contact surfaces, and then touching a variety of surfaces and equipment, and then uh, that, that equipment and surfaces touching the food. All cross-contamination. So biological items. So we have our big six. So there are uh, over 40 different kinds of bacteriological issues that we have, and uh, biological contaminations that, uh, that we can have coming in in the form of bacteria, viruses, and parasites, and molds that can occur in our food. We have our big six. The reason why they're called the big six is these are the most prevalent. They're also the ones that, are, uh, that tend to crop up the most in our foods that we have to tackle and that we have the capability of tackling. So don't worry too much about the spelling on these. You won't have to spell it as part of your test, but you do need to learn them. Okay. So Shigella, Salmonella typhi, non-typhoidal salmonella, sugar toxin producing Escherichiae coli. You guys have heard of E. coli, right? That's, that's the long Latin name for it, Escherichiae coli. So, hepatitis A and norovirus. We're going to talk more about all of these. It's not new. No, it's been around for a long time. But it's very nasty. Very nasty. Okay, so we have six main conditions specific to bacteria to allow them to grow. And so if we have these six different conditions, if you look down the right-hand side, what this is showing is just how quickly things can get out of hand, how quickly our food can change from being pleasant food that you're enjoying to be something that's lethal to eat. So if you look at up at the top right-hand corner, you've got zero minutes. You've got one bacteria cell, which we all know there's never going to be one single cell of bacteria on anything, right? We normally have thousands or millions of these cells. But just for, just for this example, we're going to say we start off with one. After 20 minutes of having the perfect environment for those bacteria, we now have two. They separate by binary fission. They pop into two, they separate into two. Then after 40 minutes, another 20 minutes occur, those two turn into four, and then into eight, then into 16. So after an hour and 20 minutes, we're looking at 16 cells from that one single one that was there just an hour and 20 minutes earlier. After 10 hours, which you may be like, surely, who's ever gonna leave food out for 10 hours? 
But guess what? What happens if you took out something towards the end of the night at work to defrost and you meant to put it in the refrigerator, you left it over on the table and you completely forgot to actually put it into the refrigerator so it could defrost safely overnight. You came back in the next morning, you're like, oh, wow, that's like $100 worth of beef I got on the counter there. I'm going to get in trouble if I throw this out. That's a lot of money. The boss will fire me. Maybe I'll just put it in the fridge now and it'll be okay. Well, the fact is that one bacteria is now, after 10 hours, over 1 billion bacteria. Now we've got real problems. You may kill, depending on what type of bacteria it is, you may kill some of them, but the, but the, but the problem is they've already produced the toxins which are still in the food. So you might kill bacteria, but the toxin that makes you sick, the pathogenic toxin that makes you sick, is still in the food, even if you killed the bacteria. That would be down to the business that you would work for. But chances are, if it was a repeat occurrence, quite possibly. But that would come down to the business that you would work for. But anyway, so we need to look at food, acidity, time, temperature, oxygen, and moisture being those perfect conditions. So time and temperature are the one thing that we can control in our environment. So the amount of time that something is out of the refrigerator, and so thus controlling the temperature that that food is at. So if I have something like a chicken that we're going to fabricate, if I have 10 that I need to get done, then don't take all 10 out of the refrigerator now and start working on them one at a time. Otherwise, that chicken's going to sit out of the refrigerator for hours. Take one out, fabricate it, put it back in the fridge. Take the second one out, fabricate it, back in the fridge. Control your time and temperature. Those are the only things that you can control on every single food, every single time. So, the time and temperature control for safety, TCS, it should be TTCS, but I guess TCS is more catchy. But time and temperature control for safety foods include the following. So we've got things like baked potatoes, fish. We've got uh, heat-treated plant foods, such as rice, beans, and vegetables. We have different meats, like beef, pork, and lamb, milk and dairy products, as well as poultry. We also have shell eggs. We have shellfish and crustaceans. Sliced melons, cut tomatoes, leafy greens, sprouts and sprouted seeds, tofu, and other types of soy protein um, that, we, uh, that we use that are great alternatives for vegetarians. They can be a great source of food for our bacteria. And then untreated garlic and oil mixtures. What is it that's in common with all of these things? Is our food. For the bacteria. Just like us, they love to eat. They have to or they die. They love protein and they love carbohydrates. Right? So they will live on any of those if they have the right kind of conditions going with it. So let's look at some of those conditions. So bacteria grow best in foods with what pH? So is it zero, very acidic, seven? Very neutral, or, or 14, where it's very alkaline. You saying 7? Anyone else disagree? I would, I would go with 7. Neutral. They love a neutral environment to be in. Moisture. So water activity. You'll hear this verbiage, okay? Basically, water activity is the moisture that's available for food bacteria, uh, in food for bacterial growth. So available water is, uh, is when it's literally pure water is best, right? So on, a scale, on the scale, it ranges from zero to one. One is regular tap water, regular water that you and I would drink. Because <clears throat> that's fully available for the bacteria to be able to consume. 
Now, what, how do we have liquid items which have less available water? Things like brine, or salted water, or heavily sugared water. Right, when you have things like glacé cherries, the sugar or the salt is a preservative. It takes away the available water for bacteria to drink. Bacteria do not have mouths. Right, they take it in through their uh, through their, their cell walls. If there is salt and sugar in that water content, then they cannot absorb the water. So it takes away the available moisture, the available water. On the other hand, you might have something like pasta. If you have dried pasta, then or rice, there's no water at all. There's no water content at all. That's why you can literally keep some of those things for years without them going bad, because bacteria can't grow on them. It's because there's no available water for them to be able to consume. All right, what do you guys think? Does this food need time and temperature control to keep it safe? Absolutely. Yes, it does. Okay. Right, well, we'll talk more about specific times in a little while. All right, so who am I? I can be transferred to food or equipment by food handlers with feces on their fingers. People become contagious within a few hours of eating meat. I'm often linked with ready-to-eat foods. Excluding staff with diarrhea and vomiting can prevent me from causing further illness. That's norovirus. This is the type of one that you get on cruise ships. I actually had it before. Um, unfortunately, uh, after I flew on a flight from the United States back to England, and somewhere along the line, there was something that I ate. I don't know if it was on the plane or if it was in the airport, but it was around that time frame because it was the following day afterwards that I got violently sick when I was on vacation. And that's never a good way to spend your vacation. Um, always bad diarrhea and vomiting until you can't do it anymore, and then more keeps on coming. So it's just, uh, it's a very, very, uh, it can be a dangerous illness to have because it can heavily dehydrate you. All right, who am I? I live in a person's bloodstream and intestines. I, uh, I'm commonly linked with ready-to-eat foods and beverages. I'm in a person's feces for weeks after symptoms have ended. Washing hands and cooking food to, re uh, to require minimum internal temperatures can prevent me. I uh, only live in humans. This is Salmonella Typhi. Okay, who am I? I'm found in the feces of people I have infected. Flies can transfer me. Now the reason why we don't want to have those things in our kitchen. I am linked with food easily contaminated by hands. Washing hands can prevent me. That's Shigella. Or Shigella. All right, I am often linked with ready-to-eat foods. I'm often transferred to food by food handlers who have feces on their fingers, excluding staff with jaundice. Jaundice is when, um, it, it, it's actually a liver condition, but it's when you can see some yellowing in the eyes, maybe some yellowing around the gills, but uh, that, uh, that's a telltale sign. Uh, normal cooking temperatures do not destroy me, and I may, uh, I may not show symptoms for weeks, but still can be infectious. So this is hepatitis A. Okay, I can be found in the intestines of cattle. I produce toxins in people's intestines which cause illness. I am found in raw ground beef and contaminated produce. Cooking ground beef to the required minimum internal temperature can prevent me. This is sugar toxin producing E. coli, Escherichia E. coli. Yes, it's a significant problem. And then if you take the uh, the cow manure and you spread it across a field with it being untreated, then that's when we can find it in things like romaine lettuce that we've had issues with as well. Okay, many farm animals carry me naturally. The severity of a person's symptoms depend upon how much of me is eaten. I have been found in tomatoes, peppers, and cantaloupes. Cooking poultry or eggs to the right temperature can prevent me from causing illness. So this is non-typhoidal salmonella. Okay, 
Let's look a little at some toxins now. This is a little different. So I am a seafood toxin. I am produced by pathogens found in certain fish. You can find me in tuna, bonito, and mahi-mahi, among others. I am produced when fish is time and temperature abused. So this is produced when bacteria that naturally occur in the skin and the gills and the gut of some fish breaks down um, histidine which is an amino acid that's found in the actual flesh itself. And it uh, then contains naturally high levels of this amino acid. Things like mackerel, herring, and sardines, and tuna also have this issue. And this is histamine. Okay, it's a biological toxin. Last toxin for you. I am, in, I am, in a, I am a seafood toxin. I occur in certain fish they eat smaller fish that they have consumed uh, that have consumed the toxin. This can then concentrate in the fish flesh itself. Things like barracuda, snapper, grouper, and amberjack can suffer from uh, sugatera toxin. It's basically where they're eating other fish that have the toxin and it just starts building up. It doesn't necessarily hurt them, it doesn't kill them, but it builds up in their flesh. They don't flush it back out. It just builds up to higher and higher uh, concentrations. What is the onset time for illness from a biological toxin? So not the bacteria, but where we were just talking about those two uh, biological toxins that we can find in those fish. So it's actually within a few minutes. Your body will want to reject that toxin. It, it recognizes it very quickly and you'll violently Throw it back out. Your, your body's natural immune system uh, will start to recognize it very quickly when it's in your gut. Before it passes all the way through and into your bloodstream and things like that, it will want to get it out as quick as possible. So what symptoms are associated um, with a biological toxin? It's actually all of these. Vomiting and diarrhea, neurological symptoms, fl uh, flushing, hives and difficulty breathing, heart palpitations, to prevent chemicals from contaminating food, we must make sure that the manufacturer's labels on the original chemical containers are readable. If they start getting scratched off or anything like that, then replace them. Follow directions and local regulatory requirements when it comes to throwing out chemicals. Use chemicals for their intended use only. Don't invent reasons or don't mix chemicals together. Separate chemicals from food and co food contact surfaces by spacing or partitioning, preferably on the opposite side of the room or in a different room entirely. Parasites, these are not common in our country. We're very lucky because we have good food systems, but they, uh, they do not grow in the food. It's important you understand that. They look for a host to grow in. So they look for nourishment, protection um, from their host, and that can be a person, animal, plant, or water. Foodborne parasites include protozoa, roundworms, tapeworms, toxoplasma gondii. So the way that we prevent um, parasites, you purchase from a reputable supply. Okay, so physical contaminants. Symptoms can be, uh, say if you, if, if you have something physically enlarged, like a paperclip, a bolt, or something like that that's in there. It could be cuts, dental damage, choking, bleeding, and pain. To prevent this, purchase fruits from approved reputable suppliers. Inspect the food on receipt and practice good personal hygiene. So uh, fungi can cause food to spoil. It's found in the air, soil, plants, water, and some foods as well. Um, they can spoil food. They can produce toxins. Uh, the cold temperatures do not kill fungi. Um, so we can also intentionally use them to flavor foods like cheese, yogurt, wine, beer, and bread. Groups who may depend, oh sorry, groups who may attempt uh, to uh, contaminate food might be people like terrorists or activists, disgruntled current or former employees, vendors, or competitors. So the FDA has their defense tool that they like to call alert. That is a sure to make sure that food products received are from safe sources. 
look, monitor the local, uh, monitor the security of products in the facility. Employees, know who's in your facility. Remember when I said, you see someone who looks out of place, question them. Be pleasant, but question them. Reports, keep information related to food defense accessible. And then threats, develop a plan for responding to suspicious activity or a threat to the operation. So when you're responding to a foodborne illness outbreak, gather the information, ask the person for general contact information, ask the person to identify the food that was eaten, ask them for a description of the symptom, and ask when that person first got sick. You need all this information so that you can then notify the authorities with accurate information. If you ask people about this days or weeks later, they may not remember all the details anymore. You need to make sure you contact them and get it to the local, local authorities so that they can then start working out where the outbreak happened and how it occurred and start working on uh, how to fix the problem. Segregate your food products. Um, make sure that if you do have foods that, that are identified as being part of the problem, we're not just going to throw them out. We're going to mark them very clearly so no one will use them. Set them aside. Um, include, a, include on the label, do not use and do not discard. Document the information, log the information um, about the suspected product and include the product description, the dates, the lot number, the sell by date and the pack size as well. Identifying staff. Keep a list of food handlers uh, scheduled during the incident. Interview staff immediately while it's still fresh in their minds. Cooperate with the authorities. Never try and work against them. They will help you um, as long as you've been doing all the right things. Uh, provide um, appropriate documentation and review procedures to determine if the standards are being met and identify if the standards are not working as well. All right, we're going to finish up today looking at food allergens. A food allergen is a protein in a food or ingredient which some people have a sensitivity to. These proteins occur naturally. When, uh, when enough of them are eaten, then an allergic reaction can happen. The immune system is mistakenly, um, uh, mistakenly uh, uh, not understanding what the food is and seeing it as a harmful product. The immune system then starts to attack the food protein, which makes your body come out with a reaction. So in the initial symptoms may just be mild, it might, but it can get to very, very severe cases as well, where death can occur. We have to be careful to try and avoid this, obviously. Anaphylaxis is the name given when you have a severe allergic reaction, when your throat can close up and swell, and you can have significant breathing problems. It can lead to death. Make sure you call the emergency services if this ever occurs. Food labeling. So we have what we call the big eight. This is where we have to make sure that the, you know, there are dozens of different types of uh, allergens out there, but the big eight are the ones that we concentrate on because the biggest amount of our population suffers from these. So we have to make sure that we include it in the, uh, in the common name of the food, or do we show it in parentheses after the ingredient, or we show it in the contains statement, as you can see over here, contains wheat, right? You have to make sure you list it. So generally, say if I was going to have, uh, if I was going to have some gumbo, if there's going to be seafood in there, I'm going to say seafood, or I'm going to say shrimp, or shrimp and salmon gumbo, or whatever it might be, to make sure that I identify those items. Let's look at the big eight. So that is crustacean fish, such as crabs, lobster, and shrimp. Eggs, fish, like fin fish, like tuna and cod. Milk and milk products. Peanuts, soy, tree nuts, such as almonds, walnuts, and pecans, and wheat. Service staff should uh, help prevent allergic reactions by describing the dishes. You've got to know your menu. Um, tell customers if the food they're, uh, they're allergic to is in the item. If they say, I'm allergic to peanuts, and that's one of your secret ingredients, you have to disclose it. You have to say to that person, you cannot eat this food because it will be dangerous to you. Um, suggest items that do not contain that particular allergen. Service staff should uh, help prevent allergic reactions by identifying the allergens uh, in special orders, 
clearly mark that order before you take it to the kitchen. Make sure that this is done to inform the kitchen staff of the allergy. Be really, really clear. Deliver that food carefully as well. Confirm the order with the kitchen staff. Make sure that no, that, uh, no allergens touch the plate. Can deliver that food separately from the other food. Right? You may want to wash your hands before you take that one plate to that one customer if they are that sensitive to it. The kitchen can, uh, can avoid cross-contact. So cross-contact is what we call um, when we're avoiding food allergies. Checking recipes and ingredient labels to confirm allergens are not present. Make sure the allergen does not touch anything for customers with food allergies. Include food, beverages, utensils, and equipment. You see that over in the picture here. They've got a special set of knives. Use that separate stuff. Using separate fryers, cooking oils, and, uh, and frying foods for customers with food allergies. And then labeling food packaged on site for retail sale. Make sure that you name all the major allergens on the label and following any additional labeling requirements.